Welcome students to a little lecture on the kind of functioning of the nervous system. Um, so there was a previous lecture that looked at kind of the basic anatomy of the nervous system. Now we're going to talk about a little bit um, how the nervous system functions, um, which really means what we're going to be talking about is action potentials. Um, but before we can get to action potentials, we have to talk about resting membrane potential, right? So every cell in your body has a negative voltage across their membrane, an electrical current essentially, um, across their phospholipid bilayer membranes, um, where the interior side of the membrane is negative compared to the exterior side of the membrane. Now, every single cell in your body has this kind of resting electrical current. Um, what kind of keeps the and sets up the resting current is the fact that we have different ion concentrations inside the cell and outside the cell. So outside the cell we have a higher concentration of sodium than inside. Inside the cell we have a higher concentration of potassium inside than outside. So um, both ions are going to diffuse down their concentration gradients, which means sodium will diffuse in and potassium will diffuse out. Now, sodium will diffuse in and potassium will diffuse out until we reach an equilibrium. We have equal concentrations of sodium and potassium across our membrane. At that point, we would no longer have a voltage across the membrane. We would no longer have a resting membrane potential, and thus we would have no ability to change our membrane potential and conduct action potentials. So that would actually be very damaging to our body. To prevent that equilibrium from being reached, we use, our body uses the sodium potassium pumps, constantly pumping against its concentration gradient, sodium out and potassium in. That maintains the high extracellular sodium and the high intracellular potassium. The other thing that is responsible for our resting membrane potential is that we have more leaky channels for potassium than we do for sodium. So um, potassium leaks down its concentrate, diffuses down its concentration gradient, and because we have more leaky channels for potassium, we lose a lot of positive charge in the form of potassium. That is what um, gets us to this negative 70 millivolt interior on the inside of our plasma membrane. Now, it's offset a little bit by the influx of sodium, but not as much sodium comes in as potassium goes out, and so we end up with a negative value on the interior side of the plasma membrane as opposed to the outside surface of the plasma membrane. Now, muscle cells and nervous system cells can change their membrane potential. They can change the current across their membranes. And we use two terms to describe these changes, either more negative or less negative, right? There's only two ways we can go. Um, and both of these use resting membrane potential kind of as a starting point. So in depolarization currents, the inside of the membrane becomes less negative than the resting membrane potential and could actually be become positive. Um, usually this is due to the inflow of some positively charged ion like sodium. Hyperpolarization, more polarization, um, means that the inside of the membrane becomes more negative than the resting value. Um, usually this means that we've either lost um, positive charge in the form of cations effluxing out of the membrane, or perhaps we have an influx and inflow of some negatively charged anion. That would make us more negative as well, but typically it's, it's the kind of outward flow of some positively charged cation. So action potentials are actually, um, actually reversals of the membrane potential, where um, the inside of the cell not only becomes depolarized um, and less negative, it actually becomes positive. Um, the actual membrane potential change is usually about 100 millivolts. Um, so typ a typical action potential, the cell will go from a negative 70 resting potential to a positive 30 action potential value. Um, and action potentials can be replenished, propagated. Um, so this is what allows them 
to um, be used as a way to kind of communicate long distances in our body and not just like one part of one cell talking to another part of the same cell. You know, we're talking about brain cells, talking to uh, spinal cord cells, talking about neurons going all the way out to to your toes so you can, you know, wiggle your toes or feel a breeze or whatever the case may be. Now, not all depolarizations will re produce an action potential. Some depolarizations are really small um, and they're not uh, a big enough change to hit a threshold value. At the threshold value, which for our cells happens to be about negative 55 millivolts, we've essentially hit sort of a critical mass um, in terms of the, the, the point of no return in terms of the, ch the change in the membrane potential. At that point, a positive feedback mechanism kicks on, um, throws open a whole boatload of ion channels for sodium, and so the influx of sodium greatly exceeds any outward flux of potassium um, and we get an action potential as an all or none phenomenon. If we hit our threshold value, an action potential will occur. If we do not hit the threshold value, we do not get an action potential. Since we can't change the size of the action potential, um, right here you have um, you know a small stimulus here you have a large stimulus you can see the size of the action potential isn't changing um, in order for our central nervous system to understand stimulus intensity you know hot versus cold, warm versus cold um, our brain actually uses the frequency of the action potentials so you can see here was the the voltage initially applied, but it was a sub-threshold stimulus, and so we didn't get any action potentials. We, got, we might get a little depolarization, but no action potentials. Uh, a larger stimulus gets us above our threshold value, and so we get action potentials, but a larger stimulus, stronger and stronger stimuli, are going to result in um, faster and faster action potentials. So that is how our brain kind of codes for stimulus intensity. That's the code we use, frequency act of action potentials. So um, something really um, heavy, um, in order for it to be perceived as heavy as opposed to light, more action potentials in the same amount of time as opposed to less action potentials in the same amount of time. So the action potentials is kind of three three parts um, four if we include kind of the resting value um, so here is a neuron at rest the gates for sodium are closed the gates the gated channels for potassium are closed um, and our leaky channels are open because leaky channels are well leaky they're always open and we are at our negative 70 resting millivolt potential um, at this first inflection point, the gated channels for sodium open and sodium kind of rushes into the neuron. That gives us that spike of depolarization occurring um, so that we can um, depolarize our membranes. At this second inflection point, the um, channels for sodium will close the channels for potassium will open. Potassium then leaves the neuron that repolarizes us um, actually not only to our resting value but actually past our resting value because the potassium channels stay open too long. They're kind of laggardly and so um, like excess potassium um, flows out of our neuron and our neuron briefly becomes hyperpolarized, meaning um, you know more negative than the resting value. Eventually, everything will reset, um, and the neuron will be ready to conduct another action potential. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, action potentials can be propagated. They can be replenished and spread um, from the axon hillock all the way down the length of the axon to the axon terminals where neurotransmitters will be released. How fast that action potential kind of spreads um, depends on two things. How um, kind of big the axon is and whether the axon is myelinated or not. 
So in larger axons, um, the kind of electrical current will encounter less friction, and so the signal will travel faster. In um, on myelinated axons, um, there are uh, voltage-gated ion channels the whole length of the axon, and so the action potential has to be replenished all along the length of the axon. So this is continuous conduction, and this is um, kind of the slower of the speeds. The fastest type of conduction occurs in myelinated axons. In the myelinated axons, the um, kind of glial membranes, Schwann cells or like dendrocytes, the myelin acts like an insulator. And then the nodes, the gaps, are where the action potential is replenished. And so saltatory conduction is often referred to as leapfrog conduction because it looks like the action potential is sort of leaping from node to node. Now, it's not. It's still traveling the whole length of the axon. It's just that in the parts of the axon, that are underneath the myelin sheath, because the myelin acts like an insulator, um, the signal is able to travel really quickly, be replenished at the node, travel really quickly, be replenished at the node, and it is thus able to travel very far um, and very fast down the myelinated axons. So when the signal reaches the axon terminal, um, that is where we come and arrive at our synapse, the connection between our kind of presynaptic neuron, then the neuron before the synapse, and the postsynaptic neuron or the postsynaptic cell, um, if we were maybe talking about an effector cell in the peripheral nervous system. Um, so the arrival of that action potential at the axon terminal causes these calcium channels to open. Um, which allows calcium from outside the cell to come into kind of little bulb at the axon terminal. That causes the release of these little vesicles filled with neurotransmitters. Um, the neurotransmitters then diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind onto the receptor proteins on the postsynaptic cell. Um, that will cause ion channels to open in the postsynaptic cell. Um, and if we reach a threshold value, um, if enough ions move into the postsynaptic cell, then we will get another action potential. Um, or, well, really what we'll get is a kind of a small, what, they're, what are called graded potentials, um, which will travel typically from the dendrites of a neuron, kind of through the cell body to finally the axon hillock, where another action potential will be generated. Um, and that's kind of how um, this process occurs. Neuron to neuron, neuron to effector cell, the action potential is kind of traveling down the axon, um, being generated at that axon hillock, traveling down, causing the release of neurotransmitters to another neuron, um, and then causing the kind of signal to travel um, further throughout the body. And that is how our brain is responsible for kind of regulating um, and being in charge, kind of the boss um, of so much of what our body does.